Yeah, so you've just seen the first episode of Man in the High Castle, and we're going to talk about it a little bit, the origins and some of the themes and, and really dig into it. Now, one of the things that struck me immediately, obviously there's alternate reality going on, but I feel like it, there's also a message here for our times. Were you, were you going for that, and what, and what sort of things did you want to bring across with this piece? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. There's, there's a lot of messages in this story that are really relevant. I think it's a story that's both timeless, you know, Philip K. Dick wrote it in 1962 and very timely, because when you look at America under fascist occupation, it forces you to question what is it about America that's been lost? Right. What is it about this country that we value? What is it we stand for versus what they stand for in the world of the show you've just seen? And those are the kinds of questions I hope people think about when they watch it. Right. And it, the, the, the thing that, that struck me is like, how many things we would lose, how much pop culture we would lose, how much just stuff that makes America, America, um, you know, from Beatles to, you know, like the, the movies, all this stuff that, that just wouldn't be there, all this art that would be lost to us. Yes. Um, and uh, that's a scary, that's a scary proposition for me. And, and, you know, I would never want to see that happen. No, that's true. And that was a lot of what we had to think about in designing the show is what would the world look like if you'd lost the influence of American pop culture, of, of Jewish artists, of African American artists, of all the minorities that would have been forced out of the Nazi Reich. And then conversely, on the Japanese side of the country, what would life be like there as well? And that's an interesting tension in the show, is, is the tension between the, the Japanese side and the Nazi side. It's sort of a parable right. for, the, for the Cold War. And then, you know, you have the band in the middle, but I, the thing I found most interesting about your character is you're actually trying to prevent a world in which someone worse than Hitler, I mean, you, you can't even really imagine that, but somebody worse than Hitler could be waiting in the wings to take over. It's absolutely a, a character that's, that's seeking balance. He, uh, the thing that drew me to him from the beginning was the fact that he engaged in the use of a 5,000-year-old oracle called the I Ching. Right. And it, it's something that I personally identify with. I was raised with the I Ching from when I was very little. My mother would always be throwing the I Ching and uh, it's really around the idea the, of fate and destiny. And I think that's something that although we would be losing pop culture, it would definitely be within the realm of the Pacific states of which my character, Trade Minister Tagomi, is ruling with um, in that that influence would go forward. So we may not have Elvis, but we got the I Ching. Right. You know, and we may have sonic jets with the Germans. And uh, the difference between technology and the soul is a big part of what the story is for me and to represent that aspect of the differences. There's a little line that's dropped in there, something about like, um, it's like Japanese versus German technology. Yes. And it was almost like a, a, like a wink to like, yeah, Japan's technology has taken over the world in some ways, but like, in this case, no, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to remember, but when I was a kid in the 1960s, Japanese technology was not considered good, actually. Right. But yeah, there's a line where uh, Wegener says to Tagomi, uh, technology is not the measure of a great civilization. I love that there's, I mean, there's so many layers to not only the, the political intrigue, but the characters there. And there are several people who are playing both sides, it seems, and, you know, several people who are just trying to kind of secure a better peace um, for the world through negotiations. One of the things I was kind of thinking about in, re in, in, in reference to that is that you know, there are some really, really subtle moves that people make behind the scenes that change history. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the themes of this to me seems like one little move can change the course of the entire world. That's right. That's right. It's unexpected consequences. But I think what you're going to see as you keep watching the series, because obviously it's set up in episode one with Carrie's character and the Wagner character, they're trying to change the world. They're trying to bring about peace. Right. And we're going to see how difficult that is to do. Yeah, and I, there's, an, there's another element that is not, you know, it, it actually seems more of the 1960s than it does of our time, a sort of nuclear standoff. I mean, maybe not, maybe not actually, given today's news. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, there, there is that paranoia of a nuclear attack, but we're living in a, in a world where America has been attacked with a nuclear weapon in this world. Mm -hmm. That's right, which is ironic when you consider our own history, where we right. dropped the atomic bomb on Japan. So, I mean, there's so much to think about. It's so rich. And I think that's why the pilot has struck a chord, because 
you know, it's our history and, and it forces you to reflect on your national identity. Now, Man in the High Castle, you know, this, uh, this film that gets circulated, um, you know, the, the person behind it is the Man in the High Castle, as, as I understand. And so this film gets circulated and that presents an alternate view of the world. And so is the whole thing a quest to figure out if this is real or if it is, uh, you know, just a sort of like a fabrication? Uh, that's a big question in the series, but it's really not, it's not the only question. It's sort of the excuse to start the story in motion. But it's very much a Philip K. Dick idea, you know, what is reality? And here you have a film that shows another world, which of course we all recognize as our world. Right. And I think Juliana's question is, can I get to that world? Right. And, and please let me get to that yeah, world. Yeah, let me get to that <laughs> yeah. world. But I think, you know, that's a question that we all ask ourselves. You know, the world we live in right now, there's so many problems, so many things wrong. And the question that this show asks is, you know, can you change this world? Can you... And, and how can you do it? Yeah, I think all the little what ifs of the show, you know, what if, if Germany had been successful, if the Axis powers had been successful, the, the Holocaust would have, you know, continued yes. further. You know, the, the characters here are worried about uh, Jewish, uh, you know, heritage. They're, yes. they're trying to hide it. And, uh, you know, that's a, a shocking thing. And, and it, it, I mean, there's so many things, so many things to dig into in this. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as the show goes on, you get a greater sense of, of the horror and of what's been lost. But I think what's most chilling about it is how many people just go on with their lives. Yeah. And um, I think there's this, this tension that we feel living in the world where we live, watching this alternate world of wanting people to, to find a way to, to change things. Is one of the comments, though, that we do this, that we just sit back and let things like this happen to us in our world and that we are letting them happen right now? Uh, you might say that. <laughs> I wouldn't disagree. <laughs> no, I mean, not to get too political. I also yeah. kind of want to talk about um, Philip K. Dick, because uh, it's been adapted a lot. Philip K. Dick has been adapted a lot. But, you know, th this it seems like a good time to do this. Um, what what made you come to this project and, and well, Philip K. Dick in general? They, Ridley Scott's company, Scott Free, and the producer there, David Zucker, had been trying to get this off the ground for five years before I came along. And then I wrote this originally for another broadcaster, and it was passed on, and it sat there for two years. And so really, it was Amazon that rescued it at the 11th hour. And I think it's, you know, it's dicey material. It's, it's very yeah. challenging material. It's potentially offensive material and very expensive to mount a show right. like this, right? Because it takes place, the pilot alone is New York, San Francisco, and uh, Colorado in 1962, and a version of 1962 that never existed. So right. Um, there's a there's a lot of layers a of expense there. A lot of there, layers yeah. of expense and, yeah. and of, of bravery to make a show like this. Yeah. So really, it, I think it could only have happened now. Um, you've seen some response, obviously, because the first episode is has been out on Amazon. Um, what has there been a backlash? Has there been like some negativity around the themes, or have you found it mostly engages people? No, I, you know, it's been remarkable uh, how warmly people have responded to it. Um, but I do think, you know, as the show goes on, I would expect that there's going to be some debate and some, yeah. some people who take issue with things in the show. But I think that could be a really healthy thing. I'm kind of looking forward to seeing how people respond. Yeah, and uh, in terms of cast, you know, how did you, how did you come upon your people? Did you actually have people in mind ahead of time or were you... you well, know? actually, I had Carrie in mind ahead of time. I tried to work with him years That's ago. That's super flattering. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> no, honestly, he's the only person I could have imagined playing this role, right. literally. Um, and he's perfect. I mean, he, he has so much soul and presence and humanity, and you love him. And he was F Philip K. Dick's favorite character in the novel, oh, and I'm awesome. sure he'll be many people's favorite character in the series as well. Um, but no, I didn't have any actors in mind for the other parts um, at all, and we kind of deliberately weren't looking particularly for, for big names in the other parts other than Carrie's. Um, we ended up casting Rufus Sewell, who's extremely well-known right. as, as John Smith, but um, it's the kind of concept where I thought if we cast people who are too famous, it might actually fight uh, right. the illusion of the world we're trying to create. And wh what about um, your character drew you to this world? I feel like my whole life has been a, a blueprint of the kind of problems that Trade Minister Tagomi goes through. Mm -hmm. It's very east-west. I was born in Tokyo, raised in Louisiana, Texas, and North Carolina <laughs> in 1962. So I went through the period of the Cold War, and everybody practiced jumping under desks, you know, right. and bomb shelters and all those things. And uh, 
to be the only Japanese in the South when over 50% of the U.S. military was from the South was not a very favorable. Right. I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> but I have to say that with that experience has given me so much a flashback, but also exact moment of still trying to work out this East-West dilemma. And, and hopefully through the material and, and my portrayal that we'll, we'll get a, a deeper understanding about the Japanese. They're, they're way too deep to be taken so shallow. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, it's such a beautiful culture. Yeah. It's uh, very much, uh, we were both born in Japan. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, and um, we, we share a lot of things in common that are very Japanese and uh, yeah I'm I'm very hopeful that people will be able to pick up on all that. Awesome. I love the iconography of this show you know it's very very shocking to see you know the the rising sun incorporated with the stars and stripes and and the swastika you know put into the American flag that one ripple of the flag that showcases the swastika it's still very shocking it's still a very powerful image and uh, it struck me, I was like, we're based in such a logo-based society right now. You know, like taking it to its extreme, you know, you, a logo represents everything in this culture. Was that intentional? Uh, yeah, and that really good point. And of course, the, the Nazis were masters of that. They really understood the power of images. Ultimate and, marketers, and they right? They were all really genius at it. And, and, and obviously, we're, we're, we're capturing that again in our own way in this series. But... That was one of the things we realized fairly early on is that there are symbols that we have, like the flag, like Mount Rushmore that's in the title sequence, and when you deface them, like with the swastika, it's so powerful because it, it, it's so wrapped up in your own national identity, those symbols. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful way in storytelling to represent the violation of our country that we're depicting in the show. Yeah, I love, I love also trying to think of an America that's actually divided by occupational forces. It's just, it's just something that's never existed in any of our lifetimes. Yes. I and mean, we've never been invaded or anything. So just that provocative thought alone is, is just a, such a good launching point for some, some well, of Well, it, it's so interesting because, you know, as you know, our national politics are so polarized right yeah. now. And, and there's so much uh, heat you know, back and forth between the two sides. And what's interesting about this show is I think everybody can agree we don't want to be occupied by Nazis. <laughs> so hopefully that's a uniting thought. And I also think every movie and every TV show in history is always sort of like unified on that front. It's yes. like Nazis are always the enemy. Yeah. You're never going to not have them be the enemy. But what's interesting to me about this is that almost all the Nazis you see, in season one anyway, are American Nazis. Right. They have an American accent. And I think what we're used to with the Nazis is they're the bad guys over there. Right, right. They're they're almost cartoons. Um, yeah, I was gonna say that. Yeah. yeah, but in this case, it's like no, they're, they're actually your neighbor, and you know they weren't all psychopaths. Right. You know, I think we tend to, especially in movies, we tend to think that they're all psychopaths. No, they weren't. A lot of them were people just like you and me who ended up being sucked up in an evil ideology. And There's how they way too many them. of them to be psychopaths. That's right? Absolutely. Yeah. But I think that just forces you to think about how people justify terrible acts to themselves and still live with themselves and go on and, you know, in the case of Rufus Sewell's character, you know, he's a wonderful father and husband, but he does these terrible things and how can that be? All right. Well, thank you guys so much for chatting and uh, I can't wait to see more of this series. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, so we've seen the first episode of Man in the High Castle. We've seen just the beginning of your characters. Tell us, um, what, what in your character do you most identify with? And I mean, I guess that's a, I guess that's a, like, a harder question for you, maybe. <laughs> well, uh, I play Inspector Kido, who is the um, head of the Kempei Tai, the Japanese secret police in San Francisco. And I guess the biggest challenge and exciting thing for me to play this part was to find things that I identify with because um, 
on the surface, when you look at the things that he does, uh, they're, they're very hardcore, yeah. um, you know, somewhat inhumane actions that he takes. So Somewhat, yeah. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. Um, just wait. No. Just wait till episode two. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was actually exciting for me, the idea to, to sort of explore what it was that made him tick. And, and Frank, Frank actually was instrumental, you know, having these conversations about, you know, what we were interested in pursuing. And it's, it wasn't so much pursuing someone who did all these terrible things as opposed to focusing on who the person was and what kind of real person would do something like that. Because, you know, we, we live in a world where a lot of terrible things happen. Right. You see it like daily. You see it amplified every moment of every day. So, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Uh, Juliana Crane, what do I identify with? Um, she's incredibly multifaceted, which is something that I had a lot of fun with, and I, I too am a little bit like that. Um, but uh, she's, you know, on the exterior, she's very strong, she's very together, she's uh, sort of living in this, you know, matchbox society with a very, very low ceiling as far as, you know, the environment, what it feels like to live at that time in that place. Um, but she's full of so many colors, and she's vulnerable, and she's fearful, and she's, you know, she loves and she lives and she fears, just like all of us. I think you can't truly have a strong character unless there's some weakness underneath them, because then it's not real, it's just a front, and it's not complex. So, um, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I feel like um, one of the things that struck me about this world is that, you know, there's so much horrific stuff that goes on that, you know, and we've seen the episode, so, you know, when you see your sister die, it's almost like this is just another callous act in a world of callous acts. Um, and, and sort of like, it, it's the thing that launches you on your quest, but I almost felt like this is just another shoe dropping in a series of like horrible, horrible things happening. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a level of there's a there's a tempered quality to the world we're living in, I think. So everything has this kind of everything's close to the vest, and everything is is you know a, a depiction of what what we're living in, which is this incredible, heavy weighted world. Um, and uh, and that particular instance, I think, for her was just absolutely shocking. I think that that propels her into this journey. That's her coping mechanism. Uh, as a as a character who perpetrates a lot of the things that you're talking about, it's interesting to me how. Um, yes, in a world that is uh, oppressed to that degree, where there is that much fear around, how resilient the human spirit is. I, I mean, I think, I think what makes the show so interesting and, and what makes it hopefully compelling is the way that human nature, human nature is just people, you survive and you move on. You know, like things don't go your way, people pick themselves up and they move on. And we see that time and time again in our reality, you know, and... Um, uh, in this country and all over the world, where when, when things don't go your way and things seem really bad, we, we find ourselves constantly inspired by those people who, who have the audacity to be happy in these terrible situations. And I think that's the beauty, the, the beauty of being human. And um, it's fun to see the places where Juliana finds happiness or finds bravery in the middle of something that's totally impossible. Or conversely, someone who, hopefully, who, who seems so... Um, authentically evil can suddenly surprise you with an act of humanity. Um, we all kind of know that evil characters don't really see themselves as evil, you know, they just kind of see themselves as an, another person, like yeah. that their course through life is just the way that it is. So is that kind of how you approach that? Absolutely. I think it's, it's uh, the challenge and the fun of it is trying to find um, the positive reason for why you would do what you're doing or... Um, uh, a reason why you would stand behind what it is that you do what you do, because um, that's why there's evil in the world. Like you said, people aren't sitting around thinking, I'm going to perpetrate these evil acts on, pe on, on people. It's they're doing what they believe. As hard as it is to believe sometimes when you're on the other side, you know, um, you know, we're living in a society that seems so split down the middle these days, and sometimes you look at the other side and you think, you can't possibly think right. X, Y, or Z, but it's in, it's in our reality right now. So, I mean, we're excited because... Um, someone mentioned the other day that this is sort of a prism um, through which to see our own existence. And, you know, through this alternate reality, when you think, oh, my gosh, they have it so bad. And then to sort of be sucked into that world, suddenly, if we do our jobs right, you can catch yourself in a situation where you realize that maybe that that's going on in our own lives too here. Right, yeah. Well, and also, I think um, one of the th things that we were talking with uh, Frank about a little bit is that 
a lot of people just don't care. <laughs> like, they're just like, hey, you know, I'm just gonna make, you know, biscuits or whatever I do. I don't know why biscuits was the thing, but I'm just gonna make biscuits and go on with my life and I'm gonna accept whatever reality it is. And I feel like it shows, you know, and on one level, it's like maybe people are blind to things. On another, people are just really adaptive to things that maybe suck, you know? Yeah, well, we're incredi we adapt incredibly well somehow as human beings. But I find what's wild about this show is that you, you will find yourself rooting for someone you would never think you would. <laughs> and, it, and it makes you question yourself and your own belief system because it's, it is shocking how much humanity there is in the characters that are, that are the, you know, sort of iconically the, the worst, so to speak. You know? Well, it's interesting because we always want to, um, and I think media is a big part of this. Sorry, I'm part of the media. But, um, like, it, you know, we, we always try to split things in half, right? Like, there's the red states and the blue states, and they're directly opposed. And this uh, show is basically saying, yep, <laughs> there's one here, one here, there's a band in the middle. And, you know, they each have different ideologies, even though they're in the access, you know, like, they each have different ideologies. But, you know, ultimately, you can, you can see yourself in that, or you can see yourself as access allies, any number of ways. So, I mean, how did you guys sort of play with that? And how did you sort of like use what's going on in the world right now to like inform your characters? I think, of course, we have fascism, we have oppression, we have all those things in the world everywhere today. And I think that this, this show particularly explores not only the physical ramifications of that, but the emotional and the spiritual and how it affects how we love and how we live and how we have relationships and, you know, the dynamics with everyone in our lives and I think that's something that is incredibly prevalent today so in a way um, you know it was it was accessible more so than one would think I think yeah, you know. yeah I want to talk a little bit about like the world being so different you know um, if if the reality in the tape or in the in the film the tape in the film is not the reality the real reality and the reality that's being shown to us is the reality then you know we're gonna lose a lot of things as that we're you know that we have as Americans, right? Um, so what things would you most miss if this world actually existed the way it does in this show? Besides liberty and freedom of speech or, you know, just anything in general. I mean, I think we really take for granted the, the, the liberty that we do have. I think it's become very normal, very, very, um, very much a part of our, you know, everyday tapestry, so to speak. Um, and none of that would be. So that, that in and of itself is something to think about. We take it for granted so much today that we're, we bend over backwards sometimes almost give it away. You know, we're, we're so sort of um, free and easy with our liberties and so quick to want to say, you know, you know, when this happens, it's okay to, you know, to give up other people's civil liberties in this situation. And when you see this reality when people don't have it, it sort of underscores what a precious thing it is. Um, Another thing that the show is really clever about is, you know, you were saying it start. I mean, it it really embraces um, the idea of stereotype initially, you know, or like a like a um, like a dual reality, like you know, red state, blue state, or you know, the Reich and Imperial Japan, and uh, we we it, it very cleverly starts you off in a place like that where you you see the you know the swastikas or the, and the bad guys and the Imperial Japanese so bad. Um, as a way of inviting you in because you think you know that. I know that, I, I, oh my gosh, right, they are so bad, and oh, that's so creepy. And it invites you and invites you in, and then all of a sudden, the palette shifts a little bit on you, and it goes from being so clearly black and white to a little bit more gray, a little bit more shades of gray here, and then hopefully, if we do our jobs right, you get near the end and suddenly you don't know who's black, who's white, he's a little bit gray, the good guy's sort of, the heroic guy's sort of evil sometimes. The evil guy is occasionally heroic. And, and then you start asking a lot of questions like, wow, that's actually sort of, that's sort of like our lives. Like Real life. Oh, yeah. no. Oh, no. Yeah. no. Let's not let art reflect that. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for talking, and uh, I'm so excited to see more. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Oh. Did you see that? What? Mr. Hitler. He's got his left hand in his pocket. Do you know why? Uh, so he can play with his balls because nobody else will. He's got Parkinson's. How much longer do you think he's got? I don't know. A year? Six months tops. Then Goebbels or Himmler takes over. Like this time, they don't just flatten D.C. with the H-bomb. They wipe out the whole West Coast. Boom. 
All right, now we've seen episode one, and tomorrow episode two is going to be streaming for free, so we'll get to see that too. But I've only seen episode one, so we got to treat that. You know, we we can't go further than that. We've got to right. just talk about okay. that. Okay, I'm good at that. Um, so I, I want to talk first of all how you kind of came to this project and and what appealed to you about it. Well, the uh, I got sent. Can I sit back? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Lay back in your yeah, Maybach. It's like this. Something on a talk <laughs> I'm going to sit back now. Is Good. that cool? So I got sent this script. Uh, I was working on something else in Washington State, and I was really tired. Um, and so they kept asking me to come in and read for it. And so I, I did a cursory read, and I was like, it sounds pretty good. But I kept saying no. Uh, I, turned, I think I turned the audition down four or five times. Wow. So anyway, uh, I'm home, and it's, I had flown in for, back to L.A. I'm in my bed. It's like 9 o'clock in the morning, and my phone keeps ringing. And I don't recognize the number. And finally I pick it up. And the voice on the other end said, uh, what the f*** is your problem? And I'm like, who is this? <laughs> and it was Dave Semmel, the pilot director, David Semmel. He, and I'd known him for like 12 years. But I hadn't seen him in a long time. And he was like, this is a really good project. And this is probably be the best thing you've done in a long time. Be at Ridley Scott's office at 3 p.m. today and hung up on me. <laughs> and so I'm, wow. like, I'm like, I think this is the man in my castle we're talking about. So I call my, <laughs> I call my manager and he was like, I asked where Ridley Scott's office was, so I went over there, and they pitched it to me, and by the end of it, I was like, I'm so stupid. <laughs> I, I can't believe that I didn't, I didn't come in for this, and so they just offered it to me. So that's how I, I came into the world. That's amazing. That's yeah. Like, well, that's, the, I mean, that's, sometimes people tell you the story, and they're like, oh, I just auditioned, and that, that was that. Right. But I love that you were just like, you, you went to Ridley Scott's office, and that, yeah. that got you on board. I come from, I usually come from a place of, I don't know, guys, like, I, uh, I, I've, been really lucky to work a lot, especially the last two years. When I moved to television uh, in 2009, and I've not been without a show uh, since then. And so, I, and I'm on two shows right now. Mm -hmm. I'm on Z Nation also. And so I was just, I was really tired, and so I was, I just shut it down. I, and I would have gotten in my own way because this is the most fun I've had on anything in so long. And since uh, I was on a show called Legit, which was canceled, and it crushed me because I loved it. I loved going there, and. Um, the thing about uh, television is that you form bonds in different ways than you do on film. Because, right. um, you know, there's a, there's a beginning and an end of a film, but TV, I could be with these people for seven years. Right. So you really, if you form a strong bond with them, it hurts. It goes beyond the show if it's canceled. It's beyond the work. It's actually your personal relationships are damaged and it hurts really badly. And I'd just gone through that. And this was a, a little bit of a, a Band-Aid yeah. for me. You know, it's interesting because I feel like there's that with the cast, but it's also with the fan base. Like it grows over time, and then you've got like seven years of the fan base, right. like loving the same thing that you love. And there's it's, it's that a, supernatural. I'm on that show also, and that's a show that I I'd known success, like a little success before, but I'd never known cult fame. And when people are really into this thing that you keep putting out, and uh, it was, I'm, I hope that for this show. I mean, it yeah. would be the best case scenario that people would refer to me as my character's name like they do. I'm called Garth probably nine times out of ten when I'm on the street because that's wow. my character in Supernatural. Now I want to know what happened in that room to convince you. Like, what was it? What was the kernel of that idea that made you want to come on board? I went in there and everybody is wild, -eyed, like wide-eyed and excited. They're talking with their hands, and that the passion is very attractive to me. Yeah, because you know the the, the uh, this business when you're in it, it should you should be. Everyone should be like that because people are all doing their dream jobs or they're learning to do their dream jobs. Um, and a, a lot of time after a while for a, people, especially at the top of their game, it becomes a job and they sort of lose that. Right. And these are people who are at the tops of their fields, like emphatic, like hand gesturing and like talking fast. And that I felt that little like tickle that I felt like when I did road trip, that sort of first rush of excitement. Um, and then the first day when I, I went... Super love road trip. I'm just oh, going to drop that in. <laughs> it changed my life. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, absolutely great. I, I was like, literally went from working in a personal injury law firm in Nashville, Tennessee, to two months later, I was on The Tonight Show. Wow. Like, it was so fast. And I remember that rush of, that rush of like, adrenaline that I had when I first started. And you do lose it, or it weakens, especially when it's not reflected back at you by other people. Right. And these people all had that. And so, and then when I flew to Vancouver to start work on the show... They introduced me, they took me around, introduced me to like their props department head, like all the department heads. And they all had the same kind of like happy, they all drank the same Kool-Aid because <laughs> Amazon gave them the time and the money to do their jobs the best that they could. Yeah. That's the enemy of production is time and money. Yeah. And those are two things that we had on the show. 
it seems like there has been a lot of um, investment, not only in the show, but the concept, the ideas, and just really like, and may maybe it is this infectious thing that you're talking about where everybody sort of reinforces these ideas to each other and says, this is important and it means something for our time. Right. And I, I also, I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot in that. You teach people how to see stuff when, when it's new. Um, if, if the network or the creators or the actors, if they have that, it, it, it's like, why do they feel that way? You know, yeah. you, you, it's maybe a subconscious thing, but the audience picks up on it. Um, and I think that we're all bringing that with this because we had such a great time. And we slowed the story way down because the book is like 250 pages and right. we're trying to get, you know, multiple years out of it. So we want to get into all the meat and really explore the world that the book creates. And we're just now like sort of scratch the surface. I love, you know, the concept that this reflects on our times. And, you know, what did you sort of like draw on from what's happening in the world now to like understand this and sort of portray it? You know, one of the questions that I get most often when we're talking about this is how would I react in this world? Mm -hmm. And I, I hadn't really thought about it. And then I started thinking about it. I was like, pretty much, well, everything that's happening in the show, like mass extermination and occupation and a fascist regime, it's happening somewhere in the world. It's not happening directly to us. Right. And we forget it. Well, the same with the show is that this has become, this world's become our operating normal. Um, a story I told yesterday, I was walking past Hitler's trailer one day. And I hadn't met him yet, and Hitler's name was on, on a, and I was like, oh, Hitler's working today. I took a picture of it. And I was like, I, I'm going to have to tweet that at some point. <clears throat> but... It's, uh, I, before, we, before we started shooting, we also went in and we talked with the creators and the, and the showrunner about, about what the world felt like. Um, and we just took that and, you know, we have two, two basic storylines going on. There's uh, something that's happening in New York. They're under the, the Nazi regime and we're under Japanese occupation in the West. And the thing that the Nazis did that was smart in this world is that all of the people who run the government and, and the fascist state are all American. Right. Uh, they're Nazis with American accents. And, and then there's this veneer of happy, productive uh, country, and that's very dangerous. What's happening on the West is we're, we're completely under occupation, so every police officer, every government official is Japanese. So I'm, watching the show, I, we subconsciously, we did something that we didn't talk about. Everyone in the New York side, they walk square. They walk like Americans. Right. And everybody in, in the Japanese side, all of the Americans, like, were small. Uh, we, but we that, was, that wasn't on purpose? That just it, virally just, happened? It just happened because, wow. uh, because the world that we set, I mean, the world that we, we created, and that's how we physically responded to it. That's interesting. There's like an ecosystem for both sides. And, you know, what's interesting to me is it seems like they, you know, we're talking about expense and stuff, just building sets to make you feel like you're in that place. Did you feel walking on the set like that was the case? The sets were amazing. Yeah. Um, it, I haven't done anything with these production values in a long, long time. Um, just to walk around on the stages we were shooting on, we're, I was just, I was blown away. I mean, dude, there was a fireplace in my trailer. <laughs> I, I, my other show is $750,000 an episode. I took a pair of socks home and production ground to a halt. They didn't have them for the double. I mean, just to have this kind of... Wow. And those little subliminal things make you feel safe. Because if, if I, you know, blow a day or I try something that doesn't work, well, we're not going to shut down. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because the pressure... The pressure to, because actors feel the pressure based on budgetary constraints all the time. Yeah. And it does limit your choices because you're like, well, we only have an hour to get this, so I'm just going to do it how it's written or exactly how it, you think it should be read and not try anything and not go anywhere. Right. It just gets told to you, right? Yeah. Like, you're going to do it this way. And you and have to. Yeah. Oh, just because of money, right? Yeah. And a lot of times, if I'm in a scene and we're, we're pushed, if I say it five times and don't say it right, and for doing it again, I'll just go to the director and, how do you think it sounds? Like, just tell me, because we don't have time. And that's the business part of it. And I, and I remember my first day, uh, when I, the first day that I worked up in Vancouver, uh, Ridley Scott's office sent us these really nice blankets. And the card said, don't be afraid to be an artist. And that's, that, that carried through. My first day on the pilot, we were blocking. You know, blocking is when you, uh, you do the rehearsal for the camera. Um, and so they know where you're going to go, so they know how to light it. Well, after, while they were lighting the scene, 
me and the two other actors who were in it sat down with our scripts and started talking through it about how we felt and where this fell in our career arc and what our relationship was. And that hadn't happened to me in 10 years. And so it was all of this kind of excitement, which is we're carrying forward now into publicity. And we can't wait for it to be seen. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. So second episode is coming up tomorrow. For you can stream it for free. Okay. Yeah, you stream right it for free. And then uh, yeah. after that, you know, we've got, uh, we've got even more. I want to know one last thing before yeah. we go. I want to know what, if, if this were the world that we were living in, if we were mm-hmm. living in this occupied world, what is the number one thing that you would miss that we, you wouldn't have from American culture in that world? Oh, wow. That's, well, we live in a world where rock and roll never happened. Okay, so, so I would, I would miss, that's a big, big thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you listen to the music, the soundtrack of our show, it's, it's all like 1950s sort of middle America stuff. And, you know, that, that, that rebellious spirit was, it never was fostered. It was snuffed out. Right. Yeah, I would miss that. So that's like America being snuffed out in a way. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking with Thanks, us. Brother. And it's been a real pleasure. For me and too. Can't wait to see more show. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks man. Brother. Thank you.